most probably i will try to give some demonstration also okay so now the basic question uh, when you use a telescope the basic yes, questions sir. that comes to your mind is that why do we have to use a telescope okay uh that there are certain things which we have to understand here uh, when we don't use telescope first of all what are we using we are using our normal eye human eye okay now our human eye has got some characteristics some certain features okay we'll understand these uh, features uh, as we proceed for instance uh, when we talk about uh, let us say what is the pixel size of human eye okay you might have some idea about what is the pixel size uh, we will see we will understand all these things as we proceed so human eye has got more than 500 megapixel so it it is better than a 500 megapixel camera now uh, at this moment we do not have that technology actually we we hardly work with something like 40 megapixel or 50 megapixel so it is we are talking about 10 times better that is the human eye response uh when we talk about magnification of by the human eye when we look at the world around us we call this as magnification of unity it's a unity magnification our human eye is not magnifying the world around us okay so when we look around us so the uh, the, the things which we are seeing these are neither magnified nor they are demagnified in fact we call it as a magnification of unity you magnification one uh there is a third aspect of human eye and that is that when you go to a dark place and then you go to a very bright place okay means uh, let us say that you are standing outside in the night time then you think about the day time now there is a dynamical change of a factor of 1 million in terms of brightness okay human eye he is adapted to this change means our human eye has got a dynamic range of 1 million 1 million means right one then you right six zeros it means that when you go from a dark place to a bright place you can see in both the places of course it, if it is totally dark you cannot see but let us say that if there is some faint uh, ob- something is there you can make out that so this is referred to as the dynamic range so we have got a very good dynamic range we have got a very high uh, pixel size but then the thing is that if you want to see very faint objects in the sky okay or very far away objects human eye is not capable of doing it it has got limitations so why do we use a telescope the most important thing is that we want to increase the light gathering power okay uh, we'll understand these things as we proceed what is light gathering power so the light gathering power is that how much photons can you receive in one second from your eye okay now we use a telescope to actually increase the light gathering power okay so this is number 1 number 2 uh, i have told you that the magnification of human eye is unity that is how we define magnification so if you are using a telescope you can you are going to use high magnification so compared to your uh, you compared to human eye the telescope has got the advantage of having high magnification so a telescope will have high light gathering power high magnification and high resolution if you use a telescope you can resolve the thing for instance imagine there is a tree which is far away from you and you are watching that tree now you can see the tree as such but if i ask you a question can you identify the leaves can you resolve the leaves separately you cannot do it but if you are using a telescope you can resolve the leaves even if it is a far away plant a tree uh, so there are three things three reasons why we use a telescope one is that it increases the light gathering power okay we receive more photons from an object compared to what we would have 
if we were using simply our eye without a telescope the second is that we can magnify objects with a telescope and the third thing is that we can resolve objects which are very close to each other okay but as such they are far away okay so these are the three reasons why we use a telescope now comes the question if you are using a telescope can you magnify a star the answer is no star remains unresolved object it means that the stars when you look at the uh, uh, stars through a telescope you cannot magnify it the reason is that the stars are so far away by no technology you can magnify a star even though star is a very big object okay our sun is sun is a nearer star so other than our sun you cannot magnify any star okay so this is ruled out then what are the objects which you can resolve with a telescope okay resolve means which you can see as a big object something where you can resolve okay uh the uh, things which you can resolve with the telescope you can resolve planets i will be showing you the photograph in fact you have seen those softwares all those photographs have been taken by the software uh, by the telescopes okay so telescopes or spacecrafts you can resolve the planets the sun can be resolved which is our nearest star moon can be resolved i'll be really showing you the photographs apart from them we can resolve cluster of stars like for example i have shown you the pleiades cluster which is known as the uh, open cluster kritikine okay you can resolve stellar cluster you can resolve globular cluster these are basically clusters of stars which are there in the universe we can resolve other objects like galaxies like supernova ejecta and like massive evolved massive stars these are evolved massive stars so we can resolve them so we need telescope to magnify the far away objects to improve the light gathering power and number 3 to increase the resolution okay so these are the three things why we need a telescope now there are two type of telescopes uh, which are in uh, use one is what we call as a refracting type telescope okay now what is a refracting type telescope in fact uh, you can make this type of telescope very easily it is not difficult to make this type of telescope uh, what we do is that we take a convex lens so you see this is a convex lens okay this convex lens has is what we call as an objective okay because it is towards the object okay and then there is an eye piece there is another lens which we call as an eye piece this is our eye okay so the configuration of this type of telescope which we call as a refracting type of telescope is basically two lenses simple convex lenses one is what you call as an objective the second is what you call as an eye piece okay and then what you do is that you put them in such a manner that the distance between these two lenses is equal to the sum total of their focal lengths now if you notice one thing here the objective lens has got very high focal length uh if you want to make a telescope like this what you can do is that you can buy a, a lens from the market you can go to a nearby scientific store you can ask for a 30 cm uh, convex lens okay you can easily get it if you want to get an eye piece you can ask for a 5 cm eye piece okay you can easily get it what you have to do is that you have to take a chart paper make a roll out of that chart paper put these two lenses one at the back and other at the front and you get a telescope this is referred to as a refracting type of telescope why we call it as a refracting type because refraction is taking place the light is passing through one lens then it is passing through the other lens okay so we it is referred to as a refracting type of telescope uh, the first person who used this telescope extensively was galileo okay galileo
Galileo extensively used this telescope uh, to watch the sky, and sometimes we call it as a Galilean telescope. Okay, uh, uh, in honor of Galileo. Okay, uh, the problem with these type of telescopes is that these telescopes become very lengthy because you can see that the focal length of these two things have to be added. So if you are going to use a lens, let us say 100 centimeter lens, this tube length will become very large. The other problem is that since the light is passing through the lens, the dispersion of colors takes place. So we get color aberrations. So we have two problems with the reflect, uh, refracting type telescope. One is that you have to increase the length of this telescope because the length of this distance between the uh, 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 objective and the eyepiece is something like the sum total of the focal length. You increase the focal length, the sum total increases. Uh, the magnification of an object here is given by the focal length of the objective mirror divided by the focal length of the eyepiece. So the greater the value of f is compared to small f, the higher would be the magnification. Okay. So if you want to make a telescope like this at your home, it can be done. Means I I did it first for first time somewhere in tenth class. Okay, it's very easy. Get these two convex lenses, one with high focal length, the other with low focal length. Just uh, put it in a tube. How do you make a tube? Take a chart paper, roll it. Actually, in fact, what you do is that you take two different chart papers, make one tube like this, another tube like this. So in one of the tubes, eyepiece will go, in other, other tube, aperture will go. Then you can adjust these two tubes. Okay, you can move it, uh, 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 you can relatively move them to get a good magnified image. So this is the principle of a simple uh, refracting type telescope. The problems with this is that the light actually passes through the lens. Okay, so it produces color aberration, dispersion takes place. Uh, there is another type of telescope which is referred to as a reflecting type telescope. Now you can understand that reflection is the principle here. Just like refraction is the principle here, light is passing through the lens, here reflection is the principle on based on which this is made. Okay. Now, uh, wh why do we need telescopes? Okay. One thing is uh, you know that if you want to observe the sky, uh, you want to watch the stars, galaxies, everything in astrophysics, we need telescopes. The other reason is that uh, you might have heard about satellites, all the satellites which are going around Earth. Okay, so we have this Earth. So we have satellites going around it. Now these satellites, some of them are remote sensing satellite. Some are just imaging satellites. Some are uh, spy satellites. Like for instance, you have a Google satellite which Google satellite systems which give you the all the Google images. Now, what do they do actually? See, what they do is that they put a telescope on these satellites or cameras and then at the back of it, there are systems which take the images. Okay, so basically what they are doing is that they are mounting the telescopes on these satellites, whether it is a remote sensing satellite, an imaging satellite or a uh, a spy satellite, a defense satellite, these telescopes are pointing in the downward direction. See, when we observe the sky, we point the telescope in the upward direction, if this is Earth. In this case, they pointed in the downward direction. And then these uh, detectors, they take the photographs, they send it to Earth. How do they send it? Through radio waves. So there is a communication, radio signal, they send those photographs and we get those images. Like for instance, the Google images. You, you might have looked into the Google Maps, okay? So there are two reasons in our techn technical so technological society where we need telescope. One is to observe the universe. The other is to observe the Earth. For instance, if you want to see the enemy movement, the enemy troop movement, you, want, you would like to get the uh, images of your enemy the movement, okay? So you need a telescope in the sky. 
that is there in the satellites okay so that that is where we need these telescopes the two places now we were talking about the refracting type of telescope reflecting type of telescope here the principle is all to gather different compared to the refracting type in the refracting type we are using lenses and the light is passing through the lenses so we have chromatic aberration color aberration because of dispersion in this reflecting type telescope we use a mirror here for instance this is the mirror this is a concave mirror concave mirror okay now and this is what we call as a primary mirror primary mirror okay i'll explain what happens see in these type of telescopes light comes from this direction from here it is coming okay let me use another color so the light is coming from this direction this primary mirror reflects it in this direction okay from uh, from all the directions then we use a secondary mirror here secondary mirror okay this secondary mirror is a convex mirror okay now what the, this mirror does is that the light which is coming from the uh, object here the primary mirror bounces it in this direction the secondary mirror bounces it in this direction so eventually the light is focused here okay and you put your eye here okay this is the place where you put your eye so what this uh, telescope is basically doing is that it is collecting light over a larger area and focusing it into a very narrow region somewhere here okay so it is acting like a funnel funnel in the sense that it collects light from a larger area so you if you increase the size of this mirror the area would increase it's as simple as that so the larger the area is the better the things will be because it will collect light from the larger area and finally put it into your eye okay so this is why what is the characteristic of this telescope and here we are using a primary mirror and a secondary mirror let me quickly repeat this thing again so that things uh, get uh, digested properly so what happens is that light enters from this side the primary mirror bends it in this direction and then the this is primary mirror this one the secondary mirror bends it in this direction so the light over this area gets focused into a very narrow region and what is that narrow region it could be your eye so this is what we call as the light gathering power of the telescope which is high now how high is this light gathering power let me give you an idea about this if you look at our human eye sorry uh, if you look at our human uh, if you look at our human eye let me draw that thing uh, okay so let us say that this is our human eye okay and if you look at the dark region there is at the center you see a very dark region this is referred to as iris okay it's basically the muscles which control the opening of the pupil layer pupil this is pupil now what is pupil pupil is the opening in your eye through which light enters okay you might have noticed one thing that when you go to a very bright place your pupil size shrinks it reduces compared to when you go to a dark place it opens up now how can you demonstrate it there is a very simple experiment stand in front of a mirror in a room which is dark a little bit dark means it's, you can at least see your pupil that is what you want to do now turn on a bright light so you will see that the size of your pupil will shrink now the radius of this pupil is of the order of few millimeters okay it is few millimeters some 3 4 millimeters okay so how much is the area through which light is entering so that area is pi r square it has got a circular symmetry okay so this is how you calculate the amount of light which is entering through your eye at a given time 
from it is this is from from through one eye okay please keep that thing in mind this is through one eye if you are using a telescope you can increase this aperture size this is what we call as an aperture size let us say that the radius of this is capital r so if it is circular geometry so aperture size would be pi r square okay so this would be the area now compare it with the area of your pupil size so this is pi r square so you see that it is r capital r by small r so this is the light gathering power this is the enhancement this is the reason why we use a telescope because it increases the light gathering power so the light which is entering through this telescope from this aperture area the entire light get focused after two reflections into your eye the pupil you keep your put your pupil side pupil here okay so this is what you refer to as the light gathering power which i have mentioned earlier okay magnification i have already explained in this case the magnification is the focal length of the primary um, uh, lens divided by the focal length of the secondary lens okay and in this case it would be the focal length of the primary mirror divided by the focal length of the secondary mirror this is secondary mirror this is primary okay this is as simple as that now i mentioned earlier that the refracting type of telescopes have a problem that they you face a chromatic aberration means the light is passing through the mirror uh, sorry the lens okay so generally in the present day technologies we don't use refracting type telescopes rather we use reflecting type telescopes okay uh, there are details here let us not worry about it in case there is a specific query i will address that maybe separately uh, but what we do is that we have ways of actually reducing the length of this telescope and the technique which was developed by newton and cassegrain okay uh, these type of telescopes are referred to as the newtonian type of telescopes reflecting type so this is the galilean telescope galileo extensively used it and this is the newtonian type that the two type of telescopes okay uh, again keep this thing in mind light enters from this side it gets reflected from the primary mirror then the secondary mirror reflects it and puts it into the human eye uh, if you want to uh, put a camera here you can do that that is what we will we are going to discuss uh, in uh, very soon okay uh, okay so this is the telescope which we have okay uh, this is the telescope which we have in our department uh, earlier i used to do these experiments regularly but in between there was a break for few years now i will do it again okay uh if you notice that this is a newtonian type of telescope the reflecting type it is the second type of telescope the reflected type of telescope and what do you notice here let me explain you first of all this telescope uh let me in fact uh, explain this diagram first see uh this is the telescope tube and the primary mirror is sitting over here okay this is the primary mirror secondary mirror is here somewhere here so let me write down this is primary mirror this is secondary mirror okay let me in fact uh, point down this place this is primary this is secondary so let me draw the ray diagram now light enters from this side there is an opening here you can see this opening here this this glass plate you can see the opening so light enters here the primary mirror reflects it to the secondary mirror and the secondary mirror puts it in this direction and here we have a plane mirror plane mirror puts in this direction this is what we call as an eye piece and we put our eye here this is the place from which we look at uh, through the telescope okay so this is a simple newtonian type of telescope in fact it, the more technical name for this is Cass newtonian Cass uh, as schmidt cassegrain telescope that is a more technical name it is after two uh, physicists to develop two particular techniques okay so again i repeat that 
the light enters from this side gets reflected from the primary mirror here then the secondary mirror reflects in this direction so light from this entire area it gets focused here okay so it is acting like a funnel means it is collecting light from a larger area and focusing over a smaller area okay uh, this is the back back view so the primary mirror is here and this is the eyepiece from which we see so the light is entering from this side in this case the light enters from this side okay uh if you see that this telescope uh there is a, a rotational uh, aspect associated here and there is a rotational aspect associated here uh imagine that uh, you have a uh, like a gun battlefield gun okay imagine a battlefield gun a battlefield gun you can point the uh, barrel in the upward direction and in the downward direction not only that you can rotate your uh, gun depending upon where the enemy is okay so there is an altitude control you can control the altitude you can uh, there there is a motor here there is a motor here you can move this uh, you can rotate this telescope down up in any direction there is another motor here you can rotate this entire telescope like this so we call it as an alt azimuth alt azimuth let me explain what is this thing altitude means you can turn the telescope in any of this direction like this azimuth means you can have this azimuthal angle rotation okay so we have this telescope and in fact this telescope is controlled by mo uh, 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 by computer okay uh, you can directly control this uh, uh, telescope through a computer for instance you can see a laptop let me show you that laptop uh, there is a laptop over here you can control it through the laptop uh, there is a, an inbuilt microprocessor here in this telescope uh, with which we control these motors there is one motor here and then there is another motor here okay uh, this is a simple uh, what you call as a stepper motor okay uh, it, it there is a gear system and uh, we uh, the gear system controls it so there there are interesting things associated with this telescope okay uh, as far as the size of this telescope is concerned this dimension i mentioned earlier that this is the aperture size light is entering from this side this is 11 inches okay so the radius of this would be pi, uh, 11 by 2 so you can calculate pi 11 by 2 raised to the power 2 that would be the area uh, amount of light entering through this this much area okay so this is the telescope and uh, uh, again i mentioned that we put our eye here so our head would be somewhere like this i do not have that photograph but uh, we used to have so many events which we used to organize even uh, uh, sp uh, normal people used to come from outside okay and uh, uh, during eclipses during other events so people used to come and we sometimes we used to get thousands of people okay now what do we do with this telescope first of all let me explain the things uh, we cover eclipses solar lunar eclipses other planetary alignments planetary transitions so we do it for university college and all the other students okay uh we have some experiments for msc and that is what we are now focusing on so we have these M experiments in msc1 okay these are prescribed experiments we were doing it regularly earlier for several years in few of last few years we was we stopped doing it but anyway now we will continue okay so this is the geometry of this telescope and uh, in fact when you look at this telescope you keep one thing in mind that the, with these type of telescopes not only you can do astronomy you can also make uh, spy satellites you can also make uh, uh, imaging satellites like uh, google satellites all those satellites you can also make uh, remote sensing satellites with these type of telescopes what you have to do is that you have to simply mount it on a uh, this uh, uh, 
uh, satellite and things will work so this is a geometry this is the primary mirror this is the place where we have the primary mirror uh, this is secondary mirror this small thing is a secondary mirror okay so light goes from this direction light enters from this direction from everywhere the primary mirror is a concave mirror it focuses the light here on the secondary mirror okay let me use some other color okay so this is the ray diagram it focuses on the secondary mirror then this secondary mirror passes it through this tube there is a tube here it passes through this tube so it means that there is an opening within the primary mirror through which the light is going through there is a plane mirror here it bends it in this direction and this is our eye piece okay uh this dimension in our telescope is 11 inches this is what we call as the aperture size generally all these telescopes uh, are named after their aperture size okay so this is an 11 inch telescope uh the magnification of this telescope is equal to the focal length of the primary mirror divided by the focal length of the secondary mirror okay so that is the magnification of this telescope now uh before we move further let me now explain you the gps system uh, i have mentioned that we will discuss certain technologies okay and uh, this is one of the things which we require uh, i have mentioned you that the telescope which we are having it is a computerized telescope in fact it has got a gps system uh, your mobiles have got the gps system that is how you actually uh, locate your position your latitude longitude sometimes when you use it to navigate when you are driving you use the gps system okay now what is this gps system let us understand that a uh, long time back uh, america developed a defense system okay so let us say that this is earth okay now what america did was that their military developed a defense system they launched several satellites okay so these were associated with the gps system gps means global positioning satellite system okay so based on this system you can if you are there anywhere on this planet you can locate your uh, position latitude longitude even altitude you can based on these things you can tell your velocity if you are moving you want to go to a place all those things can be done these are the simple thing which we are doing as a normal uh, as a common people but america developed this technology for defense they launched several satellites in space okay a typical altitude of a geo gps system uh, satellite would be something like 300 km from earth now what these satellites do is that first of all each of there are something like more than 20 satellites 22 or now they are using other satellites also okay now so there are 20 more than 20 satellites which are going around the earth so at every location on the earth at any given time there would be minimum of three or four such satellites apart from other satellites which which you can use for this work okay you can read wikipedia uh, best uh, sources for gps is please read wikipedia okay now each of this satellite has got two atomic clocks so clocks are there which are measuring the time very precisely okay now there are issues there the special theory of relativity general theory of relativity there is a time difference between this place and this place let us not worry about it uh, you can read it from wikipedia so each of these satellite are numbered let us say this is 1 2 3 4 so on uh each of these satellite has got atomic clocks two of them they send const they constantly send signal to earth okay so the place over which the satellite is going it is constantly sending a signal the other is also sending a signal and each of these signal has got a time stamp from the clock from which the signal is being sent plus it has got the stamp of the particular satellite okay 
now if you just look at your mobile phone there are certain apps you can download it in fact those apps will tell you at this particular moment which gps satellites are going in in your region if they are available in your region which is which are there on, on uh, around that location okay because these satellites are constantly going around the earth now what we do is that we receive these signals from one satellite second satellite third satellite fourth satellite let us say you are here you are using a gps system here now what will happen is that the receiver is a radio antenna which is there in your mobile phone uh, okay now you can do another exercise try to identify how many radio antennas are there in your mobile phone for instance there is one related with the mobile phone communication there is another related with the bluetooth there could be other related with some other thing and this is related with the uh, the satellite receiving antenna then there is a small chip very small chip which does the analysis of all the signal the signals which we are receiving from different satellites okay so let me repeat it again we have several gps satellites more than 20 america started this as a defense program okay because they they were using it in their missile program okay so if you have heard about it that there is a cruise missile there is a ballistic missile now how does the cruise missile go to a particular location and destroy the target there so they were use this technology was actually meant for that but then in maybe in 80s and 90s they started making it public so it came into the uh, normal people domain at least for 10 kilometers that is what i i know uh, you can check this gps system works up to 10 kilometers uh, height wise okay altitude wise above that it does not work because they are not allowed it they use it for military purpose okay so american this is an american military systems uh, basically they have allowed only up to 10 km height where we can use it above that we cannot use it maybe they have some uh, deals with different governments they are allowing certain governments they are friendly countries but at least we do not have uh, 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 normal people don't have access to that now how do you actually find out your location using this technique okay you if there several satellites are sending you the signal now there is a technique which i am going to mention uh, you can read about this technique uh, it is referred to as the triangulation method the method of triangulation i like explain it and you can uh, apply it to your understanding about several things now this is how the things goes imagine that uh, it's a war time i am giving you a scenario there is a war time and let us say that one of your enemy has entered into your territory and they are making a radio communication through their uh, uh, army okay so this is the enemy now uh, whenever this type this type of thing happens we are able to locate this enemy very quickly how uh because this fellow is uh, transmitting the radio signal so if you have a radio receiver you can tune to that particular frequency okay now how do you know that that is the enemy frequency so you have to keep on scanning okay keep on scanning your radio receiver you will receive this signal now how will you precisely know where this enemy is so there is a method of triangulation which is used the same technology is used in gps system the same technology is even used in our telescope when we actually do alignment okay in fact when we do this alignment we actually have to do it means when we used to do it regularly the students used to do this uh, triangulation method so this is how it works imagine that there are three uh, radio receivers uh, means our radio receiver receiver number 1 receiver number 2 okay receiver number 3 somewhere here and let us say that they are quite far away several tens of kilometer okay far away okay now these three re re receivers they receive this signal the radio communication okay 
now it's very easy you can make out this thing very easily uh if let us say the enemy is closer to this receiver number 1 receiver number 1 would be the first to receive a signal receiver number 2 would receive it maybe later on receiver 3 will receive it even further in time okay this is referred to as the method of triangulation so what we have done here is that we know the exact location of receiver number 1 its latitude and longitude receiver 2 receiver 3 these three receivers receives the same signal which is sent by our enemy because of its di distance from the three uh, different receivers the signal will reach there at different times it is traveling with the velocity of light okay it's a radio signal now what these people do is that these three receivers r1 r2 r3 they do some basic geometry basic mathematics work out the things they can precisely tell where the enemy is at any given time in fact if the enemy is moving the and the enemy is continuously sending the signal radio signal we will exactly know even its velocity okay now this is how, this is the basic triangulation method and this is the backbone of gps system and this is how we actually train our telescope okay when we start operating our telescope okay this is referred to as the triangulation method because there is a triangle here okay now don't worry about it whether it's an equilateral triangle or that means uh, uh, people have worked out all that geometrical things and uh, we exactly note down this uh, enemy in fact this is how we detect enemy in a, in our territory if you ever wonder how in kilometers of area how do you find out enemy then this is how we do the things okay how does this thing works in in the gps system uh imagine that you are here on earth so this is a gps satellite number 1 it sends you the signal the gps satellite number 2 sends you the signal the gps satellite number 3 sends you the signal each signal has got a time stamp and a uh, uh this uh, what you call as this uh, uh the location of that satellite the location of the satellite is fixed now the uh, your receiver in your in the gps module it's a chip basically it receives that signal and then the, the it does the processing the processing is done by the gps uh, chip itself using this time signal and the location of these satellites at a given time which is fixed because their orbits are fixed your processor is able to locate your latitude longitude latitude longitude plus altitude okay the three things are able to it it is able to tell you that thing okay now uh, pe when people develop apps the mobile apps what they do is that they have to just understand how this uh, signal is generated uh, uh, how the signal is processed by this chip and what is the format is it an ascii format or a binary format in which it is generating a data then depending upon that you can uh, you can make your app which which can utilize this information okay for instance there is a standard thing that you want to go to meet your friend at a particular place you are uh, riding your bike so you put in your gps the location of that place so it keeps on guiding you there is there are endless uh, things here means uh, means uh, you, people develop so many apps here in these things means in, in case if in future uh, especially for those of you who are doing electronics or other students also if you if you want to do go to computers enter into computer stream you can start developing apps here there are so many uh, it's a endless thing means uh, but then uh, when you are doing any adapt, even if you are developing any app uh, for your mob uh, for mobile phones you have to understand the underlying physics first please do that thing then try to understand how the uh, the this system generates a file in what is the format ascii format or uh, binary format and then 
how do how do you process that uh, information in your app okay so that it becomes user friendly okay so for instance let me give you an idea imagine that you are all alone in a city somewhere in a city it is very dark and you are afraid definitely everybody would be afraid you want to send a signal where you are okay so you are, you would like to send share your latitude longitude and altitude your friends will come to know about your location okay and they they can send you some help uh, this, these these things already exist but then uh, the interesting thing is that most of the apps which have been developed they, they have, these apps have been developed in the last 10 years and i i have been giving this lecture for more than that now during this period itself people have developed so many apps okay so uh, in case you are interested you can actually this is not the only thing there are so many other apps which you can uh, get interested in but uh, this is one particular thing about the gps uh, try to read wikipedia that is adequate enough and possible if possible try to identify can you extract any information about the gps in your mobile okay that is one thing and can you read the data at least try to locate the location of satellites at a given point okay so that would be interesting okay so uh, this is a uh, one aspect of our telescope and in general the gps system uh the telescope which we are having it is operated by a power supply there, there is a battery we have a battery we operate our telescope with a power supply apart from that we use uh, cameras okay now here i am going to talk a little bit about the technology associated with the cameras the digital cameras which you have in your mobile phones or you have it in uh, any other form okay the digital cameras uh this is the camera which we are having for our telescope this is one of the cameras of course uh, if you see it does not look like a camera but you can see there is a usb port so we put it in the uh, uh, computer and we grab the images directly into the computer why do we need the digital cameras in this particular case because you have to take the image okay if you if you, when you look at something it is your personal experience then how do you share this personal experience with other so you do it using a camera okay for instance if you have seen anything you want to tell it to other people they will not believe you so you take a photograph show it to them that is why we need a camera uh, other than that it is for your own memory means uh, okay uh sometimes what we do is that uh, when we take uh, photographs with our uh, telescope either we use this camera uh, there is another camera which is there i have not taken the photograph maybe i'll okay i will be showing you that camera also uh this is a standard digital camera which we have been using now what is there at the back of this camera okay in fact when you look at your uh, mobile phone you see only this thing you see this if this uh, lens you see a lens so what is there uh, in the camera now let me give you an idea about how the digital camera work basically the basic underlying principle because our some of the things are related with it uh when you look at look at your mobile you see a lens like this the place where there is a camera so this is a very complex lens it is a very small lens in fact what it does is that it uh, captures the image and it focuses it on something which is referred to as a charge couple device okay there is an array of semiconductor units if you notice this image there is a two dimensional array of independent cells you can see these independent cells for instance if i look at if i take this camera the this lens if i take it out at the back of it there would be something like this okay let me show you the photograph okay uh, it's not here uh, i think i missed that thing but anyway see at the back of this lens we have an array like this 
I have enlarged this array, but it is very tiny. Okay, because what you have to do is that this each each cell here represents one pixel. Okay, this is what you call as a pixel. So when you say that your camera has got ten meg, it's a ten megapixel camera. So it means that multiply this number, the number of pixels in this direction, by the number of pixels in this direction. So that will define the total number of pixels in your camera. Okay, now how does it work? Each of this pixel is an independent unit. Okay, it works independently. When your lens, this lens, what it does is that it focuses the outside world image on top of it. Let us say that if I am standing in front of it, it will generate my it will produce my image on the plane of this pixel so this is my head this is my trunk okay now wherever the photon goes and strike each this pixel it's a semiconductor device an electron is produced okay so if i look at one particular pixel uh, i i forgot to bring that uh, there is one slide here but anyway i will be able to explain it so consider each pixel as an independent pixel okay so let us say that i have a pixel i will draw it, draw one pixel so if photon comes it strikes this pixel an electron is produced this is a simple photoelectric effect okay electron is knocked out free electron at the back of every pixel there is an anode and the anode has got a circuit there is a resistance which is the other side of which is grounded okay so what happens is that the when the photon comes and it strikes an electron is produced this free electron it's a conduction electron it moves towards the anode which is kept at a positive potential with respect to the ground so a current starts flowing through this circuit depending upon the resistance a voltage drop takes place and you measure this voltage okay now each of this pixel is working as an independent entity okay so what it does is that depending upon how many photons are being uh, falling on a particular pixel corresponding amount of current in the form of electrons is generated in each pixel independently the pixels don't share anything so at the back of every pixel we have this circuitry where you have a resistance and you are collecting the current then so what we do is that the image which this lens is generating it falls on this uh, plane of this uh, pixel array two dimensional array and then each of this information of the pixel stores the component of a particular image okay one component of the image for instance this pixel here will store my eye this pixel here will store the button of my t-shirt okay so like this okay now there is a circuit like this at the back of everything from each of this pixel we collect current okay like this i mentioned you that every pixel has been assigned an address just like in the ram in a ram we have every pixel every ram flip flop is assigned an address so we start collecting the information about current from each of these pixel that information is taken in the form of current from each of these pixel it is amplified then it is converted into the digital signal because earlier it's a just a voltage current from each pixel all those pixel informations are converted into analog digital currents uh, then we have the other remaining circuit we have a clock which is deriving the everything because we are collecting information from every pixel there is a timing circuit oscillator those are the standard things ultimate thing is that we get a digital image okay so simple photoelectric effect produced on a semiconductor current is collected individually from each pixel and you digitize the entire signal so your camera which is there at the back of your lens in your mobile phone 
that circuit it has got all these things within it and then once you get this digital image either you view it just like that or you start manipulating it manipulating means like uh, you want to make your eye bigger you play around with those pixels you know the address of those pixels okay you have a digital image eventually a two dimensional digital image is the corresponding pixels which covers your eye broaden up them you want to make look uh, fair uh, increase the uh, brightness of those pixels which correspond to your face what do whatever you want to do this is what you call as a manipulation you are playing around with the image the idea here is that once you get a digital image it's very easy to play with the numbers because every pixel has is associated with the digital number you can play around with it you want to make your face look thin uh, just play around with those numbers that's it okay now when you go and go to the market and buy cameras generally you say you want a very big megapixel camera 10 megapixel or maybe 40 maximum i think is 40 at this moment it's a google uh, i do not know you can check it it, it constantly change 40 megapixel means that 40 megapixel means this multiply by this the total number of pixels is 40 megapixels uh compare it with the human eye human eye works we at the back of our eye we have retina means if i draw the eye well let me do it uh, let me explain that part also because for the sake of completeness you will understand how uh, interesting is our eye so we have uh, this uh, cornea, cornea at the front this is our eyeball okay well uh, then there is a lens here okay there is a lens here light enters from this side from the cornea the front side there is a pupil here i mentioned that iris controls the size of the pupil so light goes from here bending takes place here now two third of the bending of light it takes place from the cornea the front side the whitish portion of that thing okay Uh, this is an interesting people think that our lens is doing everything no that is not correct two third of the refraction is done by our uh, cornea one third is done by lens and it is a finer adjustment it focuses it finally the light is focused on retina here there is a retina here retina retina is basically the light sensitive organ of human body uh you can imagine that it's a there are rods and cones cells okay the light goes and strike every rod and cone a current is generated again the same principle the what we work here of course it's not a technology based but uh, the biology has evolved in such a manner that uh, each rod and cone collects the current the current is passed through the brain where the processing is done because it's all, after all it's all uh, electrical pulse our body is nothing but more than electrical pulse it's an electrical circuit body the entire thing in our body whether it's muscle how you control this lens how you control the pupil size how the electrical signal goes into the brain the processing it's all electrical impulses it's all uh, electricity and magnetism my magnetism is not that say but electricity okay now compare with this uh, ccd our human eye is something like 500 more than 500 megapixel if i remember correctly it is 570 megapixel <clears throat> so you have to wait for a long time to get that a typical size of this pixel is of the order of few millimeters okay uh, you can understand it's a very tiny entity uh, you can uh, go to uh, right uh, ccd you will see the image it's actually a chip the whole thing comes in a chip uh see in the present day technology when we talk about mobile phones the if you look at the simple uh, circuit of a mobile phone it's very simplified now uh, for instance each of this camera has got its own uh, uh, this chip all the pixel array plus this electrical uh, circuit where the processing is done image digital processing is done and now they have started putting uh, three four such cameras 
one is wide angle the other is that once you get this technology it is not difficult you can just uh, play around with the things okay now uh, let me go further uh, this principle on which it works this entire thing it is simply photoelectric effect the photon comes it strikes a pixel and a current is produced now the thing is that when this current is produced how will you tell whether it's produced because of a red photon blue photon green photon or yellow photon okay because uh, the it, it 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 does not care about the color of the photon the frequency then how come our cameras are colored cameras all these things are important you will see it very soon okay how do we have how do we get a color photograph because the way the things work a photon comes it strikes a pixel it creates a current now how is a current different from a red color photon for a yellow or green it you cannot do it so a technology is used and this is just one of the technologies there are other possibilities also okay uh, so what we do is that we use the concept of a filter you may be familiar with the filters for instance you in your childhood you might have played with the red filter when you see through the red filter only the red photo photons can pass through it when you use green filter only the green color photons can pass through they use a concept known as the bear mask okay you can read about this concept this is a bear mask now what they do is that so you have a this two dimensional array of pixels right so on the first pixel they put a red mask on the next one they put a green mask then red then they put a blue mask here okay so they are masking alternate pixels now this is interesting okay now the red mask wherever you have put a red mask so what they do is that they physically put a red mask they put a red mask in the front of a pixel so when the photons of different wavelengths are coming only the red photons will be registered by this pixel blue green will not be the when the photons pass through the green filter only the green photons will pass through the other will be blocked same thing with the blue this technology is referred to as the bear mask technology this is just one of the ways of generating the color image at least the cameras which you are using uh, this is how it works now the proportions if you see the red uh, compared to red, uh, compared to green you have less number of red and blues okay for instance in this picture you if you notice carefully 25% of the pixels are red 25% are uh, blue okay and 50% are green okay why do we use rbg rbg are the primary colors if you have these three primary colors depending upon their different ratios you can generate any color okay this is how the whole thing works there are more green filters compared to our our red and blue it has to do with the human eye sensitivity uh, our human eye is more sensitive to the green color okay this is what you call as the quantum efficiency curve for human eye so if you write here wib gyo v i b g y o r okay so let me let me draw it carefully uh this is the wave gear okay this is red color extreme red okay so red color will come here now the response of human eye is like this okay so our eye is not sensitive that much to violet color and red color compared to green and yellow our eye is more sensitive to green and yellow color this is referred to as the quantum efficiency quantum efficiency means that how many photons when they strike it results in how much efficiency of actual conversion into electrical signal in our human brain or uh, uh, finally everything okay so our eye receives different wavelengths 
differently. Our eye has got more sensitivity in yellow and green compared to the other regions. Okay, it has to do with the evolution of our human eye, how our eye has evolved over uh, uh, millions of years. Okay, so this is referred to as quantum efficiency. Hundred percent quantum efficiency means if hundred photon comes, you have converted hundred of them into meaning, meaningful signal, electrical impulse. Low efficiency means lesser efficiency. For instance, in ultraviolet, it is zero. We cannot see in ultraviolet. So even though ultraviolet photons are coming, we cannot see. Okay, now coming back to our discussion here. So we use a bare mass to get a visual image. Okay, color image. Now you can ask this question that okay, you have masked the alternate pixel, then the information is missing this manner. For instance, the information of red is missing here in the green one, in the blue one, that information is missing. But then there is an interesting thing here. Once you digitize this image, you get one red image where you pick up the image from the red pixels. Each one of them are addressed properly. There is a computer address given to them. Then there is a green image where you pick up the green uh, image, okay? Then there is a blue image, separate three image. I will show you these images, which taken with our telescope and that thing. Now, what they do is that here red is there, here red is there. In between red is missing. Now, but if you have a digital number for red in pixel number one and in pixel number three, P2 is missing for red. So a simple interpolation rule of mathematics is used to calculate how much red is anticipated here. Okay, it's as simple as that. So at the back of your cameras, this mathematics is going on, interpolation and extrapolation. In a similar manner, blue green is missing in the red pixel. So use the green corresponding green around the region, do the interpolation use linear interpolation or whatever it is so you will get a green uh, number for that this is the power of digitization once you digitize the things you get things in the numbers then you can just do mathematics okay for instance you want to look fair what you do is that pick up the pixels which cover your fix uh, you play around with this rbg combination in such a manner that it looks more fair that's it Okay, this is how I, I do it. Yeah, astronomers have been doing it for so many years. Now, all these uh, apps which you see for beautification, they have, they have started doing it. Same trick which we have been following it for a, a long time now, several uh, tens of years now. Okay, so this is how the whole thing works. You digitize the signal, you get the images. Uh, this is the image of Jupiter taken with our own telescope. This is a composite RBG image. You can see here, RBG combination. Uh, independently, this is the red color image. After doing interpolation and everything, this is green, this is blue, okay? You combine them, you get this image. Now, how do you do that? There are softwares which are known as your digital uh, 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 photo digitizers and photo digital uh, processors. We operate those things and we, we can do all these things. We can play around with them. We can uh, work out, we can combine the images, we can generate the image. Okay, so this is how the final image would look like. Now, in the, I'll spend just one or two minutes, I will cover up uh, this, some of the images. Uh, okay, uh, this is moon. Okay, you look at moon. Uh, this is a complete disk of the moon. Uh, of course, it's a phase of the moon. You cannot see this particular phase. But still, you can see something. I asked you a question. Think about it. Even during the crescent moon phase, you are able to see the rest of the moon to some extent, during the crescent phase especially. What is the explanation for this? Think about it. We'll discuss next time. Okay, so on the moon, you can see these features. These are impact craters. When a big body goes and collides, it, it produces these craters. I mentioned in the last lecture that there are bright regions, 
so the bright regions are rich in aluminium there are dark regions these are basically old lava flows okay there was a lava activity that is why it is dark in region uh this is another image of moon you can see again this face this is a particular face you can check the details we use softwares there is a software by the name registack if you want to explore that software just like that you it's quite interesting the, the, this is what you call as the digital processors the image processors okay uh, you might have heard about some of them okay uh this is uh, again moon and we here we are using a very powerful camera if you look at this thing there is a powerful camera and uh, you see this uh, it is this particular location you can see the mountains and valleys and everything this region is magnified here and there is a crater here you can see this particular crater it's a very big crater uh, if you were to put uh, let us say delhi on one side here chandigarh would be here okay uh, it's so big crater uh, the central uh, hump which you are seeing it is as high as 2 uh, km like uh, the kasoli hills okay uh, maybe uh, uh, i'll just go through these images quickly because my time is almost over okay uh, tomorrow i'll not be able to meet i will meet ne on next monday and then i will discuss the experiments and everything in the meantime the softwares which i have told you earlier please play around with those softwares because what we will do is that we will give you the lectures recorded lectures also whatever time is allotted to you for your experiments you do all the activities related with these experiments like softwares or simulations okay so you continue that work tomorrow independently uh, wherever whenever you are uh, you have that experimental time and then uh, i will meet again on monday uh, at 3 now i quickly go through the images this is moon seen on two different times two different phases of moon one is what we call as the waxing crescent phase the other is what we call as the waning gibbous phase okay again two images of moon moon okay this is a crater different craters of moon and this is the image taken with our telescope you can see the jupiter at the center there is europa ganymede and io the satellites of jupiter and uh, there is another satellite here uh, callisto so what we will do on monday is that i will show you that keep on observing this satellite for few hours the satellites will move around jupiter based on that movement we can calculate the mass of the jupiter we can calculate the gravitational constant so that is something which we will do okay uh, this is uh, when we observed jupiter on 2nd of september 2008 for almost like 2 hours you see this is the first image you see something over here this is the shadow of io one of the satellite of jupiter as the time progresses it moves here it moves here it moves here it goes here the it's a sequence of image now here it appears you see it appears in the meantime another shadow starts appearing here it goes here 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 this is ganymede i think if i remember correctly anyway whenever you look at through the telescope you see the satellite going around and based on the simple physics simple laws of physics you can calculate g mass of jupiter in fact you can calculate the velocity of light all the fundamental constants basic fundamental constants okay so this is again jupiter at 2243 at 2353 you see this structure it has moved this is the red spot okay uh, it has moved this is jupiter saturn this is saturn as image by our telescope this is again image by our telescope you can see the satellites the four important satellites here you see rhea it was earlier here then it moved here this is down it moved from here to here from 2043 in the night to 22 okay in just one and a half hour the satellite moved a titan is somewhere here this is sun as imaged with our telescope 
you can see the disk of the sun here it is not smooth first of all it is a granular it has got a grainy texture if you magnify this uh, which we did with a powerful uh, camera you see that there is a graininess here it has to do with the convection current uh it is almost like this that if you watch water boiling in a beaker you see bubbling effect okay bur 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 bubbling effect uh of course it's not water here on sun it is actually hydrogen gas so there are there are convection pockets okay so which produces this uh, texture this is sun spot okay uh the average surface temperature of sun is uh, 6000 degree kelvin okay the places where you have this sun spot the temperature can go down to 4000 degree kelvin because of some complex magnetic field okay uh so uh, this is uh, venus this is the disk of the sun this is venus as it goes here on 9th september you can see the full phase of venus on 1st december you see it's a partial phase so venus exhibit phases just like moon uh this is partial solar eclipse okay so during the solar eclipse moon comes between sun and earth so this is sun and uh, this is moon okay so you can see moon here the moon has blocked the sun partially okay this is lunar eclipse on lunar eclipse the earth shadow passes the moon okay so this is moon as the time passes you see this is the shadow of earth it is progressing okay it it's almost closed okay so this is during the full moon time when the when you can see the full moon i was mentioning earlier that we can see only one side of the moon so you always see this side of the moon so these are lavas straight away this is aluminium rich the bright region straight away in fact some people see images of their grandparents there on moon but uh, that definitely does not exist okay those are fancy stories okay so this i will discuss next